The Straw King, Chapter 16 Ginger was so dazed by Ozma's return that it was no trouble at all for Glinda's soldiers to disarm her and her army. When Ozma had collected all their pistols, she made a huge pile of them in front of the palace. She closed her eyes, summoning her magic. The metal began to melt, flowing together to form a liquid silver pool. As Ozma moved her hands, the molten metal formed a miniature replica of the Emerald Palace, perfect down to the last brick. Ozma opened her eyes and look, looked at her work with satisfaction. "'Take this with you back home,' she told Ginger, "'and never return to the Emerald City again. "'Your actions have gone against everything we hold dear in this country. "'I will spare your life and the life of your soldiers, "'but I will never forget you. "'Is that clear?' "'Yes, Your Majesty,' Ginger said, curtsying deeply. She was so humbled, she was nearly unrecognizable as the cruel and arrogant girl who stood in this pa same place and issued her challenge to the Scarecrow. He was astonished that Ozma had been able to work this change without violence. Maybe Ozma was right, and Glinda's way wasn't the only one. He had much to think about. Ginger and her soldiers filed out of the Emerald City, their heads down. Several girls carried Ozma's statue of the Emerald Palace. Ginger turned one last time and waved farewell. "'Thank you, Highness,' she said. "'I'm sorry.' Ozma nodded regally, and Ginger turned away. When the last of the girls had dwindled into the distance, Ozma sighed deeply and ran one hand through her hair. "'I'm so tired,' she said softly. And suddenly, she was just a girl again, young and inexperienced. "'We must get you into the palace, Your Majesty.' Glinda said, putting an arm around Ozma's soldiers' shoulders. "'You should rest before your coronation.' "'Is it soon?' Ozma asked plantatively. "'The Lion and his friends should be here shortly, and I'll send messengers to all corners of Oz. "'We'll have your coronation in a week, my dear. I'll plan everything while you rest. "'You shouldn't have to worry about details at a time like this. Why, you just liberated Oz.' "'Thank you, Glinda,' Ozma said, leaning her head on Glinda's shoulder. You've been so good to me. Both of you have, she added, taking the scarecrow's hand. I couldn't have done it without you. She let go of the two of them and walked into the palace. Don't forget it, uh, Glinda muttered under her breath. She fixed a sweet, sickly sweet smile on her face and stalked after Ozma. The scarecrow watched them go, his mind churning. How was he supposed to figure out what to do next? Was he on Glinda's side or Ozma's? Was there a way for him to find a side of his own? To come out of this ahead of them both? He had a lot of thinking to do. Maybe he needed a bigger brain. Or more gifts from the wizard. Maybe he needed a shot of Glinda's magic. Could he trick her into making him more clever? The palace wasn't in nearly as bad a shape as the Scarecrow had feared. Many of the servants had fled or been killed, but Ginger had done little damage to the palace itself other than painting straw bag and huge, dripping red letters across each wall of the Scarecrow's chambers. The servants who remained greeted Ozma with surprise, but soon turned into the delight. He tried to ask about dear Fiona, but didn't get far. She had not seen her among the living, but she had not seen her among the dead either. Maybe he could investigate further. Glenda slept into the room. We have much work to do, Glinda exclaimed cheerfully. Scare, why don't you find some temporary chambers for Ozma? I'll go down to the kitchen and see what we need for the coronation banquet. She looked down at her armor. I'll need chambers of my own, too, of course, she said. Make sure I have a large wardrobe. The scarecrow wasn't used to taking orders in his own palace, but there wasn't any point in arguing something so trivial with the witch. If Glinda could bide her time, so could he and perhaps he could spot his missing servant along the way. "'Come on, Your Majesty,' he said to the sleepy-eyed Ozma. "'I know just the rooms for you.' Ozma yawned and followed him up upstairs. The Scarecrow put her in a set of unused rooms, luckily untouched by Ginger's soldiers, with a small balcony that overlooked the gardens. All the remaining servants were in the kitchen with Glinda, so he made up the bed himself and found Ozma a spare nightgown in one of the cupboards. It was still early evening, but the exhausted princess climbed into bed as soon as he turned down the covers. "'Don't go yet, Scarecrow,' Ozma murmured. "'Won't you stay and talk to me until I fall asleep?' "'Of course, princess,' he said, sitting at the edge of her bed and taking her hand. Her skin felt hot and feverish. 
Too much magic, she said. It tires me out so. I didn't know if I had it in me to defeat those girls. She smiled weakly at him, and despite himself, he filed away that piece of knowledge. Her weakness seemed important somehow. He was struck by what a sweet little thing she was. No wonder Glinda's plan was working out so well. A part of him felt for her. She never asked for any of this. She had not chosen this life. She'd have been content in a cottage somewhere with a book. She was the definition of good. But he couldn't help feeling a dark thrill of elation. She knew nothing of his plans or about what he and Glinda had in store for her. He'd been clever enough to fool a fairy. And the Queen of Oz. Of course, he'd only been helping her, not harming her. Even Glinda, cunning as she was, only had the good of Oz at heart. But more and more she f he found that he loved watching his plots unspool. This, he was sure, was what it meant to be truly clever. "'Tell me a sco story, Scare,' she asked. Her innocence and trust was an assault to his senses, and he had to gather himself before beginning. Once upon a time, there was a man made of straw. He was told he was first created that he was only good for one thing, scaring away crows, and even that proved quite opposite. He dreamed of a better life, a bigger life, while tied to that stake, one filled with books and thoughts. One day a girl came along and took him down and introduced him to new friends, friends for life, and they helped him obtain the thing he had once wished for. The man was never alone again, and he was free, and he could think, and he lived happily ever after. And I took your crown, the thing you most wished for? She asked apologetically, almost as if she'd give it back if he asked nicely. The crown was never something I wished for. I only ever wanted to have a brain. A brain is everything, and it is worth more than any crown. It is worth far more than any magic, he said truthfully. If I use it right, I can put more than any wand or any crown or even any pair of magic shoes. If I use it right, I can take back what I lost today. If I use it right, I can take over all of Oz. What are you thinking, dear Scarecrow? I was thinking how brave you were today, he replied untruthfully. She yawned. Do you really think so? Was I as brave as Dorothy? Dorothy? he asked, startled. You know, the witch slayer, Dorothy who traveled through Oz with you and defeated the wizard. He smiled to think of the little girl he'd once known, not so different from Ozma herself. You are even braver, princess. But he, she was already fast asleep.